Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Richard Schneeman or Professor Richard Schneeman. I'm actually teaching a database class at the University of Texas this summer, INF uh, 385 Database Management with Rails, uh, Ruby and Rails. All previous classes have been taught with PHP, so I'm looking to expose students to, uh, you know, quote unquote modern framework or my favorite framework. Uh, so this is going to be a series of videos uh, in part for the students in case they wanted to uh, double check or go over something I, I covered. Um, it's not going to have all of the class material. It's not going to have, you know, of course, anything I, I do on the whiteboard. And this is sort of a, a reproduction. <clears throat> But if you're interested in learning more about databases as well as uh, databases with Rails, then uh, stay tuned. So who am I? If you haven't been following along, my name is Richard Schneeman or at Schneems on Twitter and GitHub. I have a Bachelor's of Mechanical Engineering from Georgia Tech. And I love pointing this out because a lot of people think anyone who writes a website or you know builds a web app is going to be some you know computer geek who... Uh, you know, just spends tons of time in the basement, never sees, sees the light of day. Well, I am actually a mechanical engineering geek, and um, I did not go to school or have any official education in computer science. So if you are interested in something and you enjoy doing something enough, then you can make it your career and your life. Um, <clears throat> well, going to Georgia Tech, I figured out that I liked programming Ruby on Rails, and I've been doing that for about six years. Uh, right now, I work for Heroku. Uh, the previous company I worked for, Gowalla, uh, got by Facebook, got bought by Facebook. Um, I have contributed to Rails on a number of occasions, and this isn't my first time teaching at the University of Texas. I've taught for about three years now, uh, but this is the first time I'm teaching an accredited class. So I'm actually an adjunct professor. Um, pretty excited about that. I mentioned I work for Heroku. Uh, to those of you who are not familiar with the platform, um, it is a way to take your applications, your web applications that you build and develop locally, um, say something in Ruby or Python or Java, um, Node, any, any, any of those, um, or in much, much more. And once you get it working locally, you can push it up to our platform and we will basically put it on the internet so lots and lots of people can actually get to it and see it from around the world um, so it's not just running on your local computer. Uh, it's pretty easy to get started. My mom has done it and I've got a, a screencast or a video of her doing it. You can just Google Mama Schneems and Heroku um, or in maybe YouTube. I don't know how many Mama Schneems there are in the world. Probably, probably not many. Um, but, uh, portions of this class will also be using Heroku and that's not just because I work for Heroku. Uh, I was doing a version of this class, as I mentioned for, for no credit previously and before I worked for Heroku and it actually used Heroku. I, I just think it's the best tool for the job. Um, but, uh, wanted to, uh, give you a brief introduction to that. Uh, so what types of applications are currently running on Heroku? Uh, here's just a, you know, super small snapshot of some applications you might have heard of. Um, you know, ASICs, Urban Dictionary is a very, uh, you know, very oldie but a goodie. Um, we've got uh, Cloud.app, which fantastic application. <clears throat> Scavenger, Flightcaster, and for those Miley Cyrus fans out there, uh, Miley Cyrus is indeed running her website on Heroku. Uh, so a lot of people when they come to me and they say, oh, you know, hey, how, how scalable, how performant is a platform? And I, you know, I just ask, well, it depends. Are you going to be bigger than Miley Cyrus? So, uh, all right. Uh, a little bit about how I teach. I like to do a lot of learning by doing. I think um, as children, we pick up and learn things really, really quickly. And that's, you know, in part by necessity and part by natural curiosity. So um, it's going to be very relatively nonlinear. Everything's going to connect and everything should be put in a place that, that makes sense. But um, ideally, I'd like to get you excited about some things before we actually learn, um, go and dive deep. So you get a roughly high level picture and then dive into uh, the, some, some of the low level details. I don't think that uh, purely starting with theory and just slowly building um, building your way up is the way to go. I don't think very very many people learn like that. You know, um, babies don't start learning um, grammar theory before they start talking. So um, 
I think it is very important to know theory and know where uh, a lot of these concepts came from and to have a good technical background. But um, it's also very important that we uh, preserve that sense of wonder and interest in learning. So I, I say that's kind of a, a Socratic-ish version of uh, teaching, not purely Socratic, but I like uh, asking questions and hopefully you will be asking questions. I will introduce you to concepts and um, hopefully you won't have all of the answers you will you know i will ask a question or you will ask a question and that will prompt you to go out find and learn more so in general you will try fail that's that's a good thing and in the process learn all right <clears throat> so some things that you're going to be learning in this class you're going to be learning databases why you're going to be using them um how to use them we're going to be learning web programming, a lot of uh, some different technologies we're going to touch on, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and we're going to be using a background uh, server, uh, uh, server side scripting language called Ruby, as well as the Rails framework. And this is going to power most of the dynamic um, interactions with our application or, or the ability for it to do things like, um, I, keep, I keep on saying dynamic website. Uh, web app and uh, the main difference between this and just static HTML is that it is it's it will change for each different person you know uh, you can log in and and your name will be on the top as opposed to someone else's name um, for for example if you go into Facebook you will see a customized feed it's not like you'll just see a random feed so those are kind of examples of dynamic websites you will also learn a little bit about the command line. If you're on Mac or Linux, it's gonna we're going to be calling it Terminal. If you're on Windows, that's going to be the command prompt. I do all of my stuff in um, OS X, so it's going to be Terminal for me. You're also going to be getting a little bit comfortable with text editors. Text editors are great for programming, um, and you're going to cozy on up. Most importantly, what I hope you get out of this class is not... You know, yes, we want you to learn all the things we just mentioned, but you're not going to learn everything. You're not going to learn everything there is to know about Ruby on Rails or programming or web, uh, you know, interactions or databases. But hopefully you'll learn enough to have a solid foundation where you can go out and learn more. You can pick up more. You can ask questions and you can understand the responses. Um, so we want you to learn how to learn everything. I think that's a really, really valuable skill. And even talking to programmers, a lot of them, yes, they, they know how to program and they are, they are good at it. But at the end of the day, if they weren't good at going out and Googling and g going on to forums and asking questions and, and IRC and talking to other people, um, then they wouldn't be nearly as good. So, um, why are you here? A lot of the people in the class, when I asked them, were talking about being interested in data visualization or um, maybe getting a job as a, uh, you know, with doing some Ruby, doing some Rails. Um, it's a very popular career choice these days, uh, if you take my word for it. Every time I go to a Ruby and Rails meetup, um, they always go around and say, you know, who has a... Who has a position? Who's looking for workers? Then tons of people raise their hands, and uh, typically quite a few less than that raise their hands when they say, who's looking for a job? So um, it is relatively high in demand, but if you want to be capable of getting those positions, you you know, you know need to understand quite a bit. You need about the ecosystem, about programming, about how to do things, um, do things right. And you know this course will get you started in the right direction, and hopefully get you interested. If you're if you're interested, you can certainly uh, can continue on, carry on, find other places to further your uh, breadth and depth of knowledge. And um, you know, hopefully, one of those days, if you're if you love it as much as I do, then um, it'll it'll be your full time job. <clears throat> All right. So I guess we're gonna start off by just letting you know that. If you haven't done any programming, programming is unlike everything else. So in typical, uh, generally whenever you try to learn something, your brain tries to associate it with things that it already knows. Um, you know, when you see a small creature run across you on a, on a trail, you try to think of other small creatures and, you know, you might, you know, instantaneously you'll, you'll say, okay, you know, 
is it is it venomous? Is it uh, is it is it pose a threat? Does it pose a danger? And you're going to say, oh well, you know, most other things that have fur and cute little tails, probably not. As opposed to you know, if you see a snake, you don't necessarily know if it is venomous or not. But just through uh, association and experience, <clears throat> you you might know that that's slightly more dangerous or should be avoided. And in similar ways, whenever we're, we are learning things in, in programming, you will want to associate this with other things that you know. And I will also provide similes and metaphors as I'm explaining things. But it's important to know that programming is like programming. And even if it bears resemblances to real world things, at the end of the day, uh, they will not match up perfectly one to one. So it's okay if I have, if I bring up an analogy or you start crafting one in your head, and it only matches up 80% of the way. um, It's important to not fret about that, that other 20%. Um, More importantly, you can bring that up as a learning opportunity. You can say, you know, hey, when you know, I, I thought it worked like this, but you're saying it doesn't work like this. Uh, you know, feel free, uh, jump on some Ruby forums. You can um, ping me on Twitter. I, as I mentioned, I'm at Schneems. Also, um, with the, the last slide, if you're interested in learning something, if you're interested in, in specifically getting something out of this class, um, please send me a message at Schneems. And, you know, I like crafting my material to, um, to accommodate if I, you know, if possible. So again, as we're going through different elements and explaining different concepts, don't get too hung up if um, if something doesn't match exactly one to one, and keep your mind open for new concepts. If we if we use um, some new words in in programming, it doesn't mean we're using them just to make you confused. It means that um, those there's nothing else um, that adequately describes that concept exactly. So we basically had to come up with a uh, some new terminology. And this is, it's very similar to the medical profession where there is a very detailed name for pretty much every part of the body and every ailment and every disease. And, uh, you know, certainly if, if something goes wrong and you have to go to the emergency room in a hurry and, you know, there's doctors that are going to operating on you, you don't want the doctor being like, uh, oh, it's, he's got a, he or she, um, has a problem with that, you know, that thing that's kind of down there in that direction. It's, it's you know, greenish, it's got tubes stuck in it, you know, hopefully you want to, you want them to say, uh, you know, that, oh, they've got, you know, they've got appendicitis, or they've uh, just a very specific term that hopefully everyone in the room understands and understands how to deal with it and and where to go next. And the same with all of their tools, Um, you know, that if they ask for a specific tool, they hope to get that exact tool and not one like it. So as you are learning, as you are picking up programming, you will become more programming literate. And um, if you if you run into phrases that you don't understand, please Google them. Please find a user group and ask what they mean. Write them down. Um, you know, write them down, and then whenever you find out the answer, write down what that means. Or, um, you know, one of the things I I wish I had done when I was starting programming is start a blog. Just start a blog and write down everything that you don't know, and then whenever you find the answer to it. Um, come back and update that post. And, um, you know, don't worry about people seeing it and saying, oh, I can't believe they didn't know that. Um, In reality, what's going to happen is, well, first of all, unless you're you're promoting the heck out of it, um, not many people are going to see it just naturally and organically. Um, But what you'll find is over a period of time, what I, I did eventually start it, start doing this kind of later on in my career. And over time, you will run into a problem that, you know, you think is really trivial, but you can't figure it out. So, you know, you, you write it down, then you, you come back and then you say, oh, here's how I solved it. And, you know, a couple of weeks, a couple of months down the road, somebody will ping you on, on Twitter or in real life and say, oh, hey, you know, you, you wrote this thing. And I had the exact same problem and I, I couldn't solve it. Um, or, you know, even on Stack Overflow, I ask a ton of questions on Stack Overflow and I hope to, you know, hopefully answer a ton of questions on Stack Overflow. Um, it's a great, great site. And um, really just with a programming f- profession, sharing uh, means a lot and is is really important to the community. Okay, so that's enough about programming. We're going we're gonna to talk about data. So I just want to start out by saying text is data and data is text. Uh, we can go back to the, the Gutenberg era and uh, take a look at, at printing presses or even you know before that and we have ancient tablets that people have written on and really data, it's anything that can be written, read, transferred, 
um, copied. So it, you know, it is information and, and information is, you know, limitless. We can, we can copy information, um, you know, theoretically limitlessly. So it's not exactly a, a new thing. It's just so new that it is easy to get to. In the web world, you're going to be very familiar with reading things off of Wikipedia. Uh, whenever we say you're going to read the web, that just makes sense to a lot of people. You, you intrinsically understand. You go to the web, you look up information, you do these searches, um, you get back information, and you read it. But it's not just you reading data. It's also your computer reading data. Um, you might read the words on the, on the page, but your computer has to read in HTML and JavaScript and CSS and translate that into a web page that you can actually view it um, you know it is you know also has to understand like TCP IP and other things that you don't need to be able to speak but it's very important that computers can can also read these things people are generally less familiar with writing and publishing to the web or they just don't even think about it in terms of writing things to the internet I like to point out Facebook. Every time you make a status update to a site like Facebook or Twitter, you're just taking a text box, you're writing in text, you're hitting submit or enter or whatever the the name of that button is, and then in the background, um, we're going to go ahead and we're going to fire off that text to a server. That server is going to take the text and do something with it. In the case of Twitter, it's going to store it to a status update and um, probably, you know, in a database somewhere. And then it's going to fan that out. It's going to say, okay, who else is following this person? And, you know, it's going to send that to, uh, to their feed. So at the end of the day, whenever someone logs into Twitter and if they're following you, they will see your status update. And this wouldn't be possible if you weren't writing data to the web um, or to their spe specific server um, or their, their database. You know, if you type something into the status update field and just hit enter and nothing happened, um, it, it wouldn't be very useful of a service. And, um, you know, I don't think Twitter would be nearly as popular if uh, you just opened up your page and there was just nothing, no status update. So it, it is very important that things on the on the web can be read as well as written to. And that's kind of the essence of what um, differentiates a, a web page versus a web app. Web apps uh, can take, handle, process, and store data. All right. So the we talked about text being data. The web is data. Um, different things. Whenever whenever you go and you sign up for a website, typically they will ask you some some information, potentially your username. Uh, which can be stored as a string. This is just going to be a series of characters. Um, we also have different types of data. We can store integers, and we can actually make up other types of um, data based on smaller pieces. So, for instance, a birthday could be made of three separate integers, or we could store it as a specialized uh, type of data called a, a date field or even date time field if you wanted to get down that low level. Typically, a, a string is going to be limited in the length, and text is going to be, within reason, unlimited. <clears throat> we also want to say that um, binary items, such as files, can be stored as, um, well, as as binary. They could theoretically be stored in a database. Um, a lot of people just think of files on disk as, you know, as one one file, one thing. Um, but at the end of the day, it has to be broken down into ones and zeros and read into a computer and then turned into that image. It has to be um, reconstructed. In, you know, The computer doesn't natively understand what a JPEG is or what a PNG is. At some point in time, it's actually written um, you know, with binary ones and zeros to uh, a, a file somewhere. Um, so anything that can be read can be written. And in general, data needs to be stored to be useful. So if we just have, you know, all of the, all of the data in the world, um, you know, all of the, the library of Congress, uh, but we have no, no place to store it and no play, no way to distribute it, then it's not very useful. And it's, you know, it's almost as bad as not having it all. All right. So if the text is data and the the web is data because the web is largely made out of uh, 
out of text as well as other uh, representations, programming is going to be moving that data. So if you have a Mac OS X and you will have Ruby installed, you can go to a terminal that would just be command shift and then enter in terminal or go to applications and hit terminal. Um, if you're on Windows, I don't know if you have Ruby installed. You might want to just install it. Once you're on the terminal, you can just type in IRB. As I mentioned, the rest of this class will be based uh, mostly in SQL as well as um, Ruby and Rails. So with Ruby, IRB stands for Interactive Ruby, and it's a way to basically have a little chat with Ruby. Um, here, if you're familiar with programming, we can just assign a variable foo to a string of bar. Um, later on, when we want to get the data out of that, we can puts or print. Um, both of those do roughly the same thing, just, just slightly different um, semantics, different meaning. And uh, when you puts foo, you get the value of bar. So this is a way we can actually save and, and store the state of that string. Um, we can store different types of variables. We can, we can store, uh, we already did a string, we can do integers, uh, and we can even manipulate them and put them into other data structures. For instance, here we are actually putting them into an array and then putting out that array. Uh, so basically, at, you know, at its core, programming is dealing with state and rearranging that state. So the state of those variables. It, it saves the state of the string Richard in a variable named name. Um, it saves the state of a, the integer 27 and stores it in a variable named age. Uh, when you couple this with flow control, such as uh, Boolean logic, case statements, if then, um, as well as loops, so like you know while loops, um, or in Ruby you would you would probably be looping over arrays. Um, you know it becomes very very powerful. Those things seem relatively trivial, but um, again you can do quite a bit with them. We will be going into quite a bit more uh, depth and detail about Ruby. Just wanted to kind of give you that as a brief synopsis of, you know, to back up my assertion that the that programming is moving data and dealing with state. So at the end of the day, the web is programmed with data that we can read and write. Hopefully you agree. Um, so let's store some data. We have a person come to our come to our website, or you know, even come to us as a, as a friend. You know, we want to we want to store, we want to write down some information about them. So uh, we want to keep their name. We want to know their favorite number. Uh, we can store that as an integer. We want to know their favorite movie. That would be that would be a string. Um, their current pet name could also be a string. And mm, you're just curious. You want to know if they like snowboarding. I happen to love snowboarding. Um, so we're actually going to store this as a as a Boolean value, you know, is it uh, true or false? Um, does this person like snowboarding? So to answer those questions for myself, I've got a uh, name as a string Richard Schneeman. My favorite number would be nine. We can just enter that in. My favorite movie, Zoolander, um, definitely. I, currently, I do not have a pet, so my, my current pet name would be Null. Using null is the equivalent of saying doesn't exist. And that doesn't mean zero. It doesn't mean false. It's not a string that says empty. It, it literally, it means does not exist. Um, it's very important that we be as accurate with our computer as possible. The computer doesn't necessarily understand if you were to have a, you know, maybe I had a dog named empty. And so I could put down a string that just said empty. And the computer, that's what the computer would think if we, if we did that, if we made a string called empty. Um, but that's not what we want. We want to tell the computer, hey, this person does not have a dog. So null kind of means like, you know, does not exist. Um, all, all data storage um, types, uh, systems, uh, databases, data stores, there we go are going to have this concept of null or does not exist. And in Ruby, um, all programming languages or m good programming languages are going to have a similar concept. And in Ruby, that would be nil. Um, so null correlates to nil in a database. It's a little confusing. It's uh, slightly frustrating that they're so close, but still slightly different. But uh, when you see both of them, they look very similar. And, uh, you know, hopefully that this slight conversation um, should, uh, you know, be brought up in your mind and you'll say, oh, okay, you know, that means basically does not exist. 
So moving on, we've got like snowboarding, and that is going to be true. So that that is um, uh, either uh, true or false, and in this case, it's true. Uh, so this is just an example of how you might represent me as data, you know, as as a set of of facts. And you know, people do this whenever you're you're meeting them. You don't necessarily think you do this, um, and you might not do it in such an analytical way. But you do remember facts about different people, and um, you know, it's it's important that we teach our computers how to remember things. We except we have to tell them explicitly what to remember and how to remember them. Um, so that's why we have to take this, uh, store it in such a way that the computer can understand. We have to convert it into strings and, and integers, maybe date times, booleans, and then uh, then store it in some way. So the next logical question uh, would be, where should we store it? Since this is a database class, obviously, I am um, going to be walking you slowly towards the uh, the process of storing data into a database. Um, but first of all, we would start off by using the whiteboard. Um, you know, we just want to show different ways you can store that same data. Unfortunately, um, I don't have a whiteboard or a um, a screen capture. Uh, or, or a desk capture device right now I can use. I'm going to be brainstorming in some ways that I can bring this exercise to you. And so this is going to be where the, the, first, um, the first video ends. You can stay tuned for some, um, some more videos as well as uh, the, the finished version of, the, or I guess, the rest of this lecture. Um, essentially, we will be translating data to a whiteboard, um, showing a way that we can store that data just on disk using kind of a, a naive solution and then eventually using a database. And, you know, we'll, we'll see kind of some, we'll talk about some performance reasons why uh, you might want to do that as well as um, just some, you know, general practical applications of storing data. Um, so thank you very much for tuning in. Hopefully, um, some of this was, was interesting to you. It's, uh, this was meant to be just a very basic and introductory lesson. So if you got confused, if you got really lost, if you have no idea what I'm talking about right now, um, please go back re, you know, you can rewatch the video or you might want to dig into some other sources before, um, coming back to, uh, coming back to this series. We will be getting pretty deep into, or eh, I guess relatively deep into SQL. Hopefully I, I won't lose you along the way. Um, and when I say SQL, I'm talking about SQL and databases. Um, that is a query language that you're going to be using to uh, query those databases. And we're also going to be getting quite a bit deeper into Ruby and Rails. Um, if you're only in this just to learn Ruby and Rails, I think uh, this is a actually kind of a, a, a great way. Um, a lot of people learn about databases after they learn Ruby and Rails. They actually learn how to use um, Rails first, and then they learn Ruby, and then after that they learn SQL. And, you know, I as I mentioned, I think kind of a nonlinear sort of a, a parallel approach is actually really good. And um, understanding how your data stores works is going to affect how efficiently you can program um, using a a language where by default its primary way of storing and retrieving things is a database. So again, if you have any questions, you can ping me on Twitter at Schneems. And thank you very much for attending. Have a great day.